All right, welcome everyone to, um, this is the uh, 340th meeting of the New York Comics and Picture Story Symposium. Uh, this is a series of talks, lectures by um, cartoonists and people interested in cartooning and um, comics founded um, over a decade ago by um, a cartoonist and educator named Ben Catcher. My name's Austin English. I'm um, curating uh, this, uh, this season uh, of the symposium for Ben um, and, 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 and bringing it together for this season. Um, one of the, every week I've been offering a brief summary of what the symposium is about. And maybe one of the ways to think about it is a series of talks about cartooning that, that um, focuses on people with um, cartoonists and thinkers about comics with a, a non-traditional approach. But when I try to, um, if, I, if I try to think about the idea of non-traditional approach with cartooning to tonight's speaker, uh, who we're so lucky to have, Anke Fuchtenberger, um, it, it is, there, there, there's kind of a, a failure uh, for me of talking about this work as non-traditional. And maybe the way to describe that or explain that is to talk about um, my personal experience of first encountering uh, Fuchtenberger's work. And I first saw her work, I believe it was in 2007. Um, I saw this book that uh, Breeze Publishing had, had put out and brought over to a festival in the United States. And when I saw this book, um, you know, I'd been interested and involved in comics for many, many years, um, but I was always looking for um, a certain kind of work that I had not been able to find. And I would, I would find a lot of work that um, tried to um, uh, approach comics as a form of literature. And I, I had a lot of appreciation for work like that. And I would see work that tried to approach comics as a, as a form of fine art. And I had a lot of appreciation for work like that. But with Fuchtenberger's work um, uh, and this book specifically, I really felt like I had found a book that wasn't trying to mirror literature or fine art, but instead to, to explore the medium of comics itself and make a statement with the tools that only comics has to offer. And not in a, a, um, a, a dry academic sense, but in a very um, alive and very emotional and very um, uh, mindful way. Um, and a lot of my thinking and a lot of my involvement in comics has been informed by, by reading um, this work um, in uh, the, this work by Fuchtenberger and this work was also done with um, Katrin DeVries. So this work has been very influential to me uh, personally. So I'm very, very excited to, um, to have Fuchtenberger as a speaker for the symposium. Um, I do want to say um, that English readers uh, such as myself, there, there's so little work um, by Anke available in the United States. Um, you can get English language editions of her work from Breeze. Um, I really uh, would, would hope for an English uh, language edition of, of this book, um, Der Palace, which, which um, I, I really love. Um, but we, we as English speaking readers uh, are very lucky because New York Review of Comics um, in January of next year is putting out an edition of um, W the Whore that will be um, available to readers in the United States. So I'm putting a link to that in the chat. Um, I am going to quickly um, read a biography of Fuchtenberger um, that she provided, but I just wanna say before I do that, that one of the, um, one of the ideas of the symposium is, um, is, is allowing a correspondence between participants, but, but between the audience and, and the speaker. Um, this, this symposium was founded really with, uh, in the wake of Occupy Wall Street in New York with the idea of bringing speakers um, that might otherwise be invited by a university and, and only available to the students paying a fee to the university, um, bringing speakers um, to the public for free. Um, and, and in an open and, and, and way that, that, that um, audiences can interact with. So I really encourage um, people in the audience to ask a question. Um, if you have a question that comes up to you during um, the presentation, there's a chat uh, icon on your Zoom screen and you can write the question in the chat. You can note to me that you either want, um, want me to read this question uh, after Anke's Anke's presentation is over, or you can note that you'd like to read the question out loud, and I, I will call on you at that time. But um, 
for especially for um, American readers and, and Americans in our audience, this really is a rare opportunity um, to to ask a question to an author that um, isn't isn't always accessible to um, uh, to American audiences and readers. Um, so I am going to read a quick biography of Fuchtenberger, and then I will uh, get out of the way and 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 um, kick things over to her. So give me one moment. And I'm also just going to put a link in the chat now um, of upcoming events in the symposium um, that you might be interested in. So uh, Anke Fuchtenberger uh, is, um, was born 1963 in Berlin. Um, since 1997, she is a professor for drawing at the University of Applied Sciences in Hamburg. Um, she has around 30 books. That really shows the poverty of what's available to us here in the States. Around 30 books um, are published in different languages and countries. W the Horror, a project with uh, writer Katrin DeVries is published and republished in five languages. Um, uh, her original work has been shown in single exhibitions in various international galleries, such as Gallery Martel in Paris. Um, she was awarded the Lifetime Achievement Award at the Comic Salon in Erlangen. I'm, I might be mispronouncing that. Um, and um, she lives and works in uh, Vorpommern and Hamburg. Um, so without further ado, um, I, will, I will hand things over to Anke Fuchtenberger. Uh, and let me, um, and you are unmuted, Anke, so you can begin. Um, thank you very much for this invitation. Um, I would like to apologize that I will read a text because it's much more easy for me to um, uh, read uh, the text. And But uh, this evening I had a very beautiful experience. Um, I had an examination of a student uh, with whom I was working uh, for some semesters uh, in the master class. And he is one of the uh, students who tried something I proposed uh, in my classes, which is not a, not a, a strict pro proposition, but a proposition to uh, try to work without a storyboard. And uh, he had today his final uh, examination with a beautiful work. Uh, and uh, so I was very... Um, encouraged to speak about um, my work um, about the the fact that I'm um, doing most of my um, narrative work uh, comics whatever we call it uh, without storyboard I uh, for me it's very important to draw and to let the narration come with the drawing um, and because this uh, work is unpublished and it's not to be seen because it's in a museum, I wanted to show you um, a project which I did in 2007. Um, I will share my, my um, screen. One moment, please. And I do it for everyone, no? Yeah. Okay. Um, the title of this work is Tracht und Bleiche, which is already a very, a very German thing. Um, Tracht is a word for different things like costume, garb, dress, uniform, lord, spunking. And Bleiche is bleach. And um, I like these both words a lot because they have the th, the th, th, um, uh, in two different ways. Tracht is the hard one, Tracht and Bleiche is a very soft one. Okay, in uh, 2007, I got the um, proposition from the Westphalian State Museum in Münster to draw a comic altar. 
The so-called comic altar should contrast the Haldan altar in a similar sites, which is situated in the medieval collection of the, oh, mm, this was interrupted and I don't know why. Can you see that? I have to start again with the picture. No, I we could what I could see was the um like the all the files in the folder. Yes. Um, but when we were uh, meeting before, I saw the first slide like filling up your screen um, mm -hmm. as as the as the beginning of the PDF. Yeah, I will try again. I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. I, I told Austin already that uh, usually my students show. Uh, their uh, works with sharing the screen and not me. <laughs> That's why I'm not so. Uh, do, do you see it now? No. Well, I think you have to share your screen again because uh -huh. uh, I think you stopped sharing it. But now, yeah, now you know how. Now you have the empathy for the students. Of, of yes, I have the how empathy. Difficult this is. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, okay. Yes, I see. Um, yeah, you're on. You're on maybe the third slide now. So if you want to, but yes, I see it. I see your screen and you're sharing it. And and is it, I, is it full? Uh, full screen? Yeah. Or yeah. Yeah. It's full screen. It's because full screen. I don't see that. Okay. Although you could. Although no, I mean you can see the thumbnails on the side. So maybe go to. But I mean I can see them very very well. There you go. It's better than. Yes, now? that's perfect. That's perfect. Okay. okay. okay I'm going to mute myself again. Thank you. Okay. Um, so mm, my altar should uh, contrast the um, uh, Haldan altar, which is from the 15th century tempera on wood. Um, and you see now a photo uh, of, the, of this old um, altar. Um, I was meant that I could edit events as in Guantanamo, Manhattan, or in the World War II instead of the Christian passion. I had other stuff which has been burning between my fingers for a long time. With a magnifying glass, I looked at the pictures of refugees looking for women, those of today and ones from back then. My interviews in Geneva with midwives and Gene gynecologist from Doctors Without Borders about rape as a weapon of warfare. The silence of my grandmothers and aunts, their lifelong suppression of this experienced violence at the end of the war in 1954, um, 1945, sorry. A quote from Mary Daly's radical feminist manifesto, gynecology indicates the direction of my search. To fully reverse the reversals, we have to deal with the fact that patriarchal muse contains stolen mythical power. They are like distorting lenses through which we can see in the background. Carlo Ginzburg, in his book Hexensabbat, founded the Christian religion in a European shamanism, and in his, in his research, he write up, digged into quasi early historical non-European myths. The mission of the museum included challenges on different levels for me. Study of the medieval altar in Christian iconography. Two, how contemporary is art and narration? Three, how can I approach sacred objects as a pagan? Four, my education and my curiosity forbids me illustration of illustration of illustration. Does this assignment hold the prospect of knowledge and understanding? Five, to create a comic in this space, one would see all images at the same time. How should a narrative work in space? And is that still an understandable comic? Six, to what extent is the subjective experience transferable to social ones? And what about the holy, the miracle, and the, yes, the ridiculous? Seven, can the profane that to remain in front of the temple explicitly ascribed to woman be a source of the sacred? Eight, how can I depict a miracle without disenchanting it? And nine, can the whole thing be funny in the sense of a comic? 
10. Because of the above aspects, in the end, I remain my own client because I'm so interested in the answers to these questions that I didn't care about the museum. 11. How should I deal with this immense freedom? Just like Christian mythology made use of older myths, absorbing them and twisting them, I tried the beginning by tapping details and sketching, drawing uh, of the Haldan altar to their original meaning, profaning them, so to speak, by pretending um, I was, uh, if I was unfamiliar with Christian iconography. I twisted their meaning from the symbolic back to the centrally tangible. What is a cross? It's a wood, it's a tree. What is the ointment jar of Maria Magdalena? Simple, a vessel. On the back of the altar, which, which was actual everyday view, there is a picture of Salome with the head of Baptist John. The way this Salome looks at the plate on which the head of John lies seems for me very clear. Capturing the moment in which a woman looks in the mirror, she bright and tender, her reflection wild, dark and bloody. I was happy about this misunderstanding. How about a permission? Is this a reflection of a disreputable pagan woman in the Christian scent or the other way around? From the embalming vessel of Maria Magdalena towards the bees, it's not far. Bees protect themselves from small intruders, killing them with steps and throw them out of their hive. But for bigger invaders like rats and weasels, however, also several bees are not enough. They embalm the stepped animal with propolis and wax. So the dead mummifying body with its decomposition may no longer cause damage in the hive. Maria Magdalena, companion of Jesus, who later became one of the food washing sinner, a whore, to me, the fooling girl Katerlieschen from the fairy tale by the brothers Grimm, which provokes the priest with her nudity. In the process of drawing, they gained, no, sorry. So I put a protagonist on stage who in the first simplicity only stood for themselves. In the process of drawing, they gained in complexity and got into a spiral togetherness always around the wood no, the living tree around. My object of devotion, the wooden cross. No, no, the wood. No, the tree with all the inherent peoples. The willow tree in antiquity, the sacred moon tree, an ever living tree which can be cropped indefinitely and which keeps growing again, damned as a witch tree in the Middle Ages. And the bees who were sacred in ancient Egypt as carriers of soul, immortal, they too, because of their daughter colonies. I draw comics without storyboard. My method, the intervention of the narrative during the drawing. This method is sometimes like stumbling on a swinging suspension bridge without being able to see where the other end is attached. I'm trying out of the moment to develop vivid drawings which have their own narrative string without sketches beforehand and the drawing itself is a narrative motor. Can it make sense out of itself? The experiment is characterized by questioning the obvious, play through all possible realities, use mistakes, accidents and misunderstandings as a catalyst, and don't ignore the subjective subconscious. Drawing gives me insight, which I would not have gotten to without. The altar shape is made up of 31 hexagonal individual parts. I took <clears throat> advantage that the hexagonal shape is equilateral polygon with which, uh, with which a level can be filled without gaps. It was challenging, challenging that I didn't have to create the narrative structure linearly, left to right. And it was very funny that I recently, two years ago, heard the first time about the carrier bag scenery of Legin, Legin and I was very happy that uh, with the Alta I proved this already without knowing her. 
Um, but several narrative levels could be connected that move spatially around the tree because each side of the hexagon has six possible connection points for a new panel. The whole object is seven meters long and three meter 50 high. Three narrative strands emerge from the drawing. The first refers to a saying I heard from a beekeeper. We survived the death of Jesus. We will not survive that of the bees and it's about the move of a queen bee with some of their people in an old willow tree. The second story of a morning in Catalician's life where her mother recommends her to keep her virginity and taking care for the door. Catalician experiences a miracle as she crawls through the tree with the bees to look for her grandmother. The mother gets cuffed up in the events of the war which require that help will be given her by the beehive, beehive which is daughter Catalician. Further on the horizon lies the sugar factory into which the workers and the sugar beets are transported from which the soldiers and candy bags are transported. The world of production, of consumption, of substitutes, of drugs with enormous noise and fire hazard. The third string is the alchemy, drawing with charcoal, using willow coal and gold pigment. The willow tree does not just stand in the landscape like an organic tower of Babel, but it is also an atanor, an alchemical furnace, and through its digestive tract, the swan is digging in the remains of the decayed root Yesa. The swan embodies for me the Yiddish saying, Mensch tracht, God lacht. Man seeks, God laughs. But we only see the tail here. And now I would like to show you some, oh. and again, I can't uh, continue the presentation. Sometimes I've noticed sometimes with PDF slideshows, it will do that. I think you can, um, there, there might be a way just to manually, rather than clicking through it, just like maybe you can use the mouse. I can't do anything. Oops. Ah. Ah, okay. There you go. Now I would like to show you the single. Uh, it's difficult because it's not linear. Uh, so I try to uh, read you the single um, panels. Mother leaves the house. Bring grandmother the food and above all, keep the front door. Catalician bakes pancakes for herself and grandmother. Just watch the pancakes while I fill the syrup. The new queen is born and toots to warn the old one. The old, the old queen leaves her hive with a large part of the worker bees. They seek domicile in a hollowed out willow tree. Yes, run ahead to grandmother. Oh, I forgot to guard the door. All the syrup has spilled. How maltreat the poor earth, sweet balm on such wounds. The mother fetches water, a car with soldiers drives by, a beat transport. Look at our little one, a oh, too bad she didn't make it. Truck columns, the sugar factory is on fire. Mother greets the grandmother who is sitting in the sun while breeding. Good morning, how are you? Take care. Grandmother is startled by the gr great roar of the swarm of the bees. What a roar is that? Air raid alert. Grandmother goes into the bunker. The old queen is escorted to her new home by the bees. Catalician crosses the river to visit her grandmother. She climbs into the tree. I'm sorry, there is missing a picture, but I will not interrupt. She climbs into the tree where grandmother's shoes are already. Dogs have to stay outside. 
Meanwhile, the mother has to pass drunken soldiers and is overpowered by them. Below, deep under the tree, the roots intertwine with the bones of the grandmother. The moon is above the moon tree. Mensch tracht, God lacht. Mankind strives, God loves, a digging swan. Sympathy and caring produce warmth. The mother is dead, or is she asleep? She orders, you didn't see anything, do you hear? Meanwhile, Kata Lysian has experienced a miracle in the beehive. She says, mother, I saw that white and white meet a sugar beet that has fallen from the truck on the country road. Look at our mother, it's a shame, she didn't make it. Katalysian catches the demagogues who say, and what do the beasts get in winter for providing us with their treasures all year round? Sugar water. Katalysian carries the little soul through the river. The little soul breathes deeply. Katalysian brings the little soul home. Mother, you forget something. Mother, yes. That seems to look like me. A truck drives past. The war is over. The sugar factory has work for us. Off to the sugar factory. Yes, and this is the whole um, thing again. <laughs> and this is, was my little lecture. And um, I can answer questions. I can... Um, Yes. Well, thank you so thank you so much for that, Anke. That was beautiful to that was beautiful to watch. I can start off with a question. Um, you talked um, a, a bit about um, about the idea of not working with storyboards and 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 having the 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 energy or the 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 engine of a drawing itself create the narrative, and um, I think that that's something that is immediately readers of your work, I, I think, pick up on that without it being told to them. I, I think emotionally and in, in encountering the story, there's that that's that it's it's so successfully done that you 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 understand that logic. But it is very atypical from especially in this country, how people think of um and actually could I ask you to to um to stop the sharing of your screen because then we can we can have people um um, but it is very, especially in this country, it is a very atypical way of um, of thinking about cartooning. Um, but I think one that 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 has um, has great great merit. I mean, like not even potential, like great merit for for graphic narrative. How did you come to that way of working? And you know, you mentioned in that talk, so it's clearly something that's still important to you about how you work. Um, how did how did that develop in your process of working? Was it how you began working, or um, I'm very interested in that. Um, I have to say um, I'm not. I, I was not growing up with comics. Um, I was in the so I, I was grown up in the socialist part of Germany. So there were there were nearly no comics. Uh, the only comic I really uh, know very well was uh, Rudolf Töpfer, um, which I love still and uh, until today. And um, when I started to make my own um, artistic works, um, I started with a um, theater poster. So the connection of literature and um, pictures was for me very strong. And uh, more I did this uh, uh, theater posters, um, I did around um, 80, not so much, not in a long time, but the more there was this desire to, to go more in the narrative part of the pictures. And um, people told me that my uh, posters look like they um, are in between two, um, uh, hand, handling to um, things which happened, 
between two happenings. And uh, I like this. I was thinking, yes, it's like uh, to go from one moment to another. And um, when the wall came down and I could buy comics and I could look comics and I could really enjoy um, the, uh, the, um, the first time comics, uh, I understand that this could uh, be a very interesting way for me, but I was already old. So it was strange to, to uh, not have the tools for drawing comics. And so I did it in my way. I, I started very simply to connect pictures with um, another picture and um, uh, be very careful about the gaps in between. And I didn't have any school in comic drawing. And um, first also, I, I was uh, very uh, shy to think that I can speak, that I have to tell something. My uh, narration, I had a lot of things to tell, but I was afraid that I, that it wouldn't be interesting. And so I was working um, uh, often with people who were writing and um, the most uh, nice um, experience was to work with Catherine de Vries. She's an author. And when she gave me her text, uh, it was a wonderful um, inspiration for um, a long time. And um, the technique maybe is not also not so useful. I started uh, always in big sites. I like big sites. I studied also sculpture. So I had always the idea of physical space, uh, big sites. So my drawings and original are always very big and um, I like uh, also like that, uh, because of that, I like uh, material which is very physical, like charcoal, for instance. Would you, um, this way of working and you're describing how you came to it and it's a, a unique way of encountering the medium and you're saying that you um, didn't have schooling in comics, which I think for, for was probably true for so many people that weren't entering the medium unless they were coming to it as a trade, um, you know, it, as, 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 as commercial, uh, thinking of it more as a commercial medium. You um, have spent a long time teaching now, and I, I, it's a, um, I, I've, it, I've met people who, who uh, have, have um, are very influenced by the teaching you've done. What would you say are um, the expectations that people have of, of the art form of cartooning in contrast to maybe what you want to teach them, or if there's some kind of reading of the medium that students have in general that you work with or possibly work against, or 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 something that contrasts with your your view of the medium, and maybe if that's changed over the last couple of decades, mm -hmm. Does that makes sense. Um, in my, I started my work at the university with a subject of drawing. This was my profession. I, I had to teach drawing in a very academical way. And um, then with my uh, interests of, uh, uh, beside my um, obligatorial work, I started to make facultative classes with comics and it was very, successful the people came we spoke about comics and it began um, a time very um, very nice that people were interested in comics in Hamburg and so I uh, put it more and more in my classes in my teaching but it was always a very practical work we um, draw we speak about drawings we speak about narration but it's not that I hold lectures uh, it starts always from the drawing and I still hold the drawing classes like very academic um, drawing classes with which I still like because I think it's a um, good way to uh, be involved in the process of um, be conscious about perception, be conscious about the world which is surrounding us and the students who start uh, to study I have uh, always a first semester class with drawing it's really like the beginning but it's uh, for me always very beautiful to see 
um, how they start, how they get slowly near to it and how after some semesters we can start slowly with narration, with um, words, with uh, combining words and um, drawing. And it's for me, it's not to teach comic, but to um, understand how pictures and um, or images or drawings can uh, be connected with words words and I see it as two complex worlds, the world of the drawing and the world of the word and uh, for me it's very important to have um, um, uh, to, to um, experience this and um, it developed more and more in the direction of comics and uh, meanwhile we have also other uh, teachers, uh, we uh, invited for teaching comics, and so I felt free to uh, develop more <laughs> in a special direction, which I call graphic essay, which is very interesting because I can do this also with very young students to um, uh, narrate things which are somehow autobiographical biographical but at the same time um, drawing looking perceive and uh, be in contact with the world not to have fantastic stories but to to uh, draw and write about the perception of the today of uh, and how it is connected to the past of course but this is uh, in the last um, let's say three years is it's was successful the um, uh, we're developing a lot of students were developing very interesting um, graphic essays it was very interesting for me I very much encourage um, people in the chat to ask a question but I am definitely going to just take one more opportunity to ask an, another question um, uh, uh, on this topic um, when you say that you're not working um, with, it's it's also you know I I um, teach students and when they choose to do uh, comics even the most expressive experimental artists in the class they tend to break down their comics in storyboards and it's a very it's very fascinating to see someone who might not have the tendency to do that either when they think of comics to do that um, but I'm very interested in when you're when you're working on a story that will eventually become a book. Um, do you um, do you improvise the narrative from image to image and then go back in and edit once you're midway through the narrative? Or is it more um, that you will, how does, if you're, I mean, most people um, who use storyboards use them to, to edit the story before the drawing process begins. So I'm wondering where editing comes in in your process. Um, I do um, a lot of research. That's why I, I spoke long uh, about the Alta subject because uh, I wanted to show how was my research before. And um, now I'm working on a book on which I nearly work 10 years, which is long, long for me. And I'm very embarrassed to say, but um, because I don't have a text or I don't have a, um, um a storyboard um it's really that the drawing develops the process of drawing develops new narr narration and um during drawing i feel that i have to control it of course it can't be uh, telling and telling and telling and but it's uh, very interesting for me i don't want to bore myself when i draw a storyboard and then i ha would have to draw it again i would it would be very boring for me. I can't do that. I don't have too much time. And I think that I have to, um, to follow the, um, the ideas and the things which are coming with the drawing because this is what I can. My hand is the, the thing which has to transport my inside in, on the paper. 
and I'm very curious. So that's not that I, um, the editing is maybe um, um, in between now with my new book on which I'm working. Often I put out stories which are like a little blah, 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 where, where I think, okay, this, you, you told this, but it doesn't mean anything for the story. That's why it uh, takes so long. But uh, if I don't like a drawing or if it's not okay, I have to do it again. I, I do again the drawing, but I don't, um, how to say, I don't sketch them. I, I do it again. Also with the altar, I have, uh, I think, six plates uh, from 31. I, I had to put out and do it again. I didn't like them. I really do think that's one of the things that prevents uh, the comics medium from, from benefiting from voices from certain people is that uh, the, the drudgery involved in, in drawing a character the same way over and over again or, or translating storyboards. I, so many artists with, I think, important things to say are naturally turned off by that. And I, I think that, um, I don't think it's, it's so interesting too that, that Topher is one of your influences because I think that early comics really embody some of the freedom or, or not, not even really freedom, but some of the way of working that you, that you talk about. And I do think the genesis of the medium has more of that than, than maybe how it's evolved in general. Uh, there are some questions here now. I'm going to read one from Generoso. Um, he says, uh, thank you for speaking today, Anke. I very much enjoyed your presentation and I'm excited to see more translations of your work here in the States. Um, oh, and prior to that, there was someone saying, um, Carlos says, thank you so much for sharing that wonderful work. We have, would have no other chance to see outside of the museum. Um, and then, so I'm gonna continue with Generoso's uh, comment because he goes into a question. I see some influence of Egon Schiel in your work. Was his art an influence? And if yes, did you have access to his work early in your life? Uh, Egon Schiel? Yes. Did I understand right? Well, no, <laughs> okay. I, I, you can blame <laughs> Sorry. horrible pronunciation. No, 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 it's only uh, to be sure. Um, Strange. I, I wasn't thinking that. Yes, of course. It, it's like, um, I think with Egon Chile, for my opinion, uh, I'm sorry, it's not uh, disrespectable, but uh, with Egon Chile, it's a little bit with Hermann Hesse. When you are a very young artist, you, you like it, you like it a lot. And then later on, it's not so interesting anymore. When I saw Egon Chile 2000. Uh, 13, I saw a big exhibition and um, I wasn't, I was thinking, oh, wow, well, uh, yes, but I was in love when I was 13. Yes, it was a very uh, early influence, but um, nowadays I think, um, no, not, not anymore. I'll read a, um, there's a question from Lucia Lemova. Uh, would you like me to read this question um, or would you like to read it out loud? If you want to respond in the chat, I can um, I can read it for you. Um, they say, thank you for your great speech. I like your work very much. As far as I know, your work is mainly in black and white. Uh, why and um, why and where did you decide to take colors into your work? Bring colors into into the game, they say. Uh, the question was why I decided to take colors. I and where when what I guess why you decided and, and when that began. Ah. Um, yes, it's strange because I started with a lot of uh, uh, very colorful. My, my posters are very, very colorful. I used, uh, uh, how do you call it in English? Um, because I was grown up in a, in a country where there was uh, no money, no um, material, no colors, no ha uh ha -huh, We used uh, to make a very uh, old fashioned process. We, we um, select, uh, no, um, separated the colors with the hand. So like the old comics had been, uh, like the lithography, uh, uh, the, which became later on a technique which are using the young people again. 
So my, my posters were really uh, very rich with colors. And then I started to draw comics uh, in black and white because uh, it was uh, a new experience to leave the color and to go completely into the story. And still today, I have sometimes the feeling that the color is disturbing my narration. I don't know why. I think uh, if I start to work with color, I, I work with color, of course, but not in comics, um, then I, I feel that the color is becoming a subject by itself. It's like a painting with pure colors. It's more interesting for me than to use the color as something illustrating my, my drawing. Is this understandable? Yes, yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, I will, um, uh, Carlos has, has another, Carlos, would you like to, um, would you like to read this um, a question yourself or would you like me to read it for you? Oh, hey, I, I can uh, read it off. Uh, okay, I great. just thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this is wonderful. Um, looking forward to more reprints of your work. I'm lucky enough to have that old edition of uh, W the Whore, um, uh, which is a wonderful uh, book. Um, but I was just wondering that once you did start reading comics, um, you know, how old were you and uh, what were some that, you know, might have stuck with you or, you know, uh, proven to be an influence later on? Um, I'm sorry, uh, it was a little bit fast. I'm sorry. Can you uh, repeat the question? Sure. I'm sorry. Once you began reading comics... Were there, uh, you know, particular works that you were impressed by or that stuck with you or that may have influenced you? Yes, yes. Um, thank you. Um, yes, it was very funny. It was like a somnambul. I was with uh, Henning Wagenbrett, my friend. We were uh, went um, for the first time together um, to West Berlin uh, when the wall came down and he was already there. He had been already there, I and me not. And he invited me to go to a comic shop and I didn't know nothing about comics. And uh, I went into the comic shops and I was overhand about all these uh, colorful books and so much books it was and so colorful I, I was uh, overhand and then I was thinking oh, what can I do I, I don't I, I can't start somewhere where can I start and I went really like somnambul I went into to one place where I find where I found um, Mark Byers agony and this was the the it was uh, for me a real a big thing i really love it i was crying and uh, it was incredible this book for me and uh, it was the only i took out of this shop and uh, then after it became um, uh, Jacques Lustal Jacques de Lustal it was very important for me as a comic uh, artist because with him uh, I saw also that uh, comics could be uh, like also with Mark Bayer, they, they are sad. They have a special melancholy, which uh, was very interesting for me. And also the way um, Jacques de Lustal draw was very interesting for me. These uh, have been beside Rudolf de Pfer, uh, the first, um, how to say, the first um, influences and very long, I, I, it took uh, a long time that I was impressed by them. Was it maybe um, you described this experience of going to this store and, and seeing all this colorful work, did it maybe later become just this, sometimes I think of comics, just the, the wide library of, of what's been published in comics is it, it's, there, there's this explosion of color, but there's also this, this vast amount of drawing and was maybe that was maybe that's something that was compelling just how these these webs of drawings uh that are kind of shielded from discussion in in maybe education about art or art discussion in general just this was did it did it did it remain because because again your work is not always 
uh, published in color uh, or, or predominantly published in color. So was it, was, did the drawing itself, was that, did that become compelling um, uh, soon after your first encounter with comics? Just, just the vast amount of, of published pages of drawings? Um, I was starting slowly um, in the theater. It was uh, uh, it has been mostly um, off theater groups, not not big theaters, and I was uh, working for them without money. It was uh, a strong. Um, time uh, after the wall came down everything changed and uh, uh, nobody had money but everybody wanted to do a lot and change the society and it was very interesting so I was working often for groups uh, which hadn't money and when I produced for them uh, like flyers posters and um, Especially, I produced little booklets. This had been my first comic uh, tries, my experience in comics. It has to be black white because there was no money, and this was my starting. I, I I could not choose to do it in color or to do it in black and white. I had to do it in black and white and produce it very very cheap. So this was. Um, and I uh, maybe another big influence in my my childhood was uh, I don't know if you know her Kitty Kolwitz. Um, it was a an, an artist who, when I was a child, was very important for me. She drew with charcoal, and um, with that I was very encouraged to um, continue drawing with charcoal. So it's. It, it's by himself by itself charcoal is very colorful I like it a lot when I draw with uh, charcoal it there are so much shades of gray that I uh, don't miss color um, I am going to read a question from Flynn Kinney he says um, thank you Anke for speaking with us tonight I have very much enjoyed your books throughout the years is there a shop or gallery in Europe where your prints or posters might be purchased that's always a good question for a talk. Where, where print? Uh, prints or posters. Uh, is there a shop or gallery in Europe where your prints or posters can be purchased? Mm, no. <laughs> <laughs> How do you? Uh, it, it is, uh, there is an, an, in Italy, in Bologna, uh, there is a very beautiful uh, galleries uh, printery who is producing some serigraphies, but these are not posters. It's more like art, um, art print. But my posters are, uh, they don't exist anymore. I have some copies, but um, I don't make posters anymore. And they are not printed again. Do you mean that? Is that the answer? Um, I think that's a good. I think that's a good answer. But I, um, I am interested if someone might be, especially um, readers in the U.S. who will be encountering, you know, in January through New York Review of Comics, your work for the first time. Where, if they are interested in other works, and maybe they will, maybe they're okay with an untranslated work. Are is are there places to buy um, like your books aside from your prints and posters? Are there is there what like what would you consider your contemporary your publisher of your more recent work? Um, who would who would if 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 I was to ask you who is your your the, the publisher of your most recent work that is of of most importance to you? Where would be would it be? I, I know Fremont has done editions, um, but I believe they did W the Whore. So your maybe newer work, who would be your contemporary publisher? Um, yeah, it's funny. This is really funny because uh, in Germany, there are some problems sometimes with publishing. I changed also sometimes the publisher. I published a lot of books with a reproduct, but my recent work I published in Italy and not in Germany, which was really, um, it was it was an experience because my publisher, who I asked if he want to publish this book, uh, he said that it's not comic and that uh, he want he didn't want to make it. Um, yes, and it's um, Canicula in Bologna. They published my recent book, and. Um, 
the, the book I'm working on now will be uh, at Reprodukt in Berlin and also Futuropolis uh, in uh, Paris. And at the same time, I think, I don't know how we can continue with the tra um, translation. And um, Alessio, <laughs> I don't want to say something, but Alessio is here. Well, I, um, I, I, we have time for, and also we should say that we should really thank Anke for doing this talk as it's much later uh, where you are. It's probably just about midnight uh, it's there. It's midnight, yes. yes. So thank you so much for not only yeah, for, for staying up and, and giving us this this talk. Um, is there anyone else who has a question? I have one more. Um, but if you do have a question for Anke, I'll, I'll count to 15 and we have we have time for just one more question. And if you just want to. I'm not tired at all. So for okay. me, it's OK. <laughs> so, so we have time for we, we do have time for more than one question then. If I, I may I ask another question? Of course. All right, all right, Anki, thank you. Um, what, uh, can you just talk a little about uh, when you do create? Um, do you work in silence? Do you like music? Uh, do you have a studio? Um, do you work in, you know, at home? Or uh, do you like to go someplace to work like a studio? Uh, just uh, wondering about, you know, how you sit down and, and start uh, creating. Oh, this is a nice question. Thank you. Um, uh, I was a single parent. I had a little child. Uh, when I had a little child, I started to draw comics. It's the same time. And so I had to stay at home. I was uh, drawing at night and during the day I was with my child. And so there was, uh, how to say, I, I educated myself in staying at home. Um, even if I desired a lot, a big studio. And um, then I um, uh, was working, I was leaving the city where I'm teaching, Hamburg, and I went to the countryside where I uh, bought a place where I have a big studio. This was for the first time when I was already 50, uh, I had a big studio where I, I like to draw really big sides uh, drawings. And um, the more I'm working on comics, uh, when I work on comics or on narration, I, I, I need the silence. I don't know why, I, I more, I'm getting older, maybe it's um, that I'm distracted and I liked the concentration completely on drawing because developing the narration during drawing needs completely concentration. It is absolutely not, um, I can't have any destruction. So the process before is mostly very um, horrible. It's a horrible time before I start to work because it's like running around and um, feeling so uncomfortable and not knowing what it will be. And the first drawing is mostly horrible and so I have to do five and not to think much about and then to come into the drawing process and um, then it becomes more warm and, and better and uh, uh, I need to um, to be sure also about the sides, about the paper, about the, the material because maybe this is one of the details of my new book, uh, there is no um, homogenic style in the book. I try to develop in each chapter a different style or somehow also different material. It, maybe it will not be different style, but different material. So it needs uh, something unknown what I don't know why it has to be like that but I have to search a lot and to do experiments until I know that it has to be like that is this understandable <laughs> it's a little bit uh, a torture <laughs> no that makes perfect sense um Lucy, Lucy, uh, Chi, uh, Lucy has a question um have you tried working digitally iPad and Procreate no 
I, the most digital I ever did are some uh, corrections in Photoshop. <laughs> and uh, yes, I colored uh, some uh, silk screens. I colored them separately uh, digitally, but uh, no, I don't work digitally. Not even my uh, animation film I did uh, uh, years ago. Um, I did it uh, like uh, in Dinosauri, I did it really drawing by the hand and uh, reproducing it with a camera and uh, yeah. Jessica Taylor asks, uh, Jessica, would you like to um, say this question out loud or would you like me to read it? Uh, up, uh, yeah. um, I just wanted to ask, you have a very distinctive uh, letter, fo letter forms, lettering, the way you write words on the paper, both in the script and in the, well, the non-script, the separate letters. And I wondered if you'd be able to just talk a little bit about where you kind of how that developed and, and how, where the forms came from, because it's really beautiful. Thank you. Um, yes, it, uh, I studied graphic design and uh, my professor was uh, really, a, he was a maniac with, with types and he was a very famous at that time. And um, I was a very bad student, really. It's not, a, um, I'm not, a, it's not a joke. Um, so I like to draw, I like to, to paint, but I didn't like to make typography. And so it was like um, to give him an, an answer to, to say, uh, I, I developed this uh, type already when I was a student. And it was like, no, I don't want to use this, um, what is it? Um, plo uh, piombo, what is the, the English word for piombo? Blei? Ah, I don't know. Um, and I was drawing my own type and I used, um, I used things on from my childhood. For instance, the E with a much uh, with a lot of. Um, it was that when I was a child, I saw this uh, letter and I was thinking, uh, there are a lot, and this is funny. There are a lot, you know. How much it's not important, but there are a lot, and so I tried to develop on each letter a very. Um, 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 unique um, form and so it became like a, a possibility possibility to get into types and letters and writing and I like it a lot meanwhile I, I really I like it I do also sometimes some jobs for friends that I do some uh, signs or writings for them as um, signes yeah I think of your use of of um, text and the, the way that you draw text is as another, I think very, it's an essential part of experience of your comics because you treat the text as part of the, the texture of the drawing as the whole. And I think many cartoonists try to do that and but there, there often seems to be a separation between the texture of the drawing and, and communicating the text, like the text being completely understandable without any pause. And I, I think that, that your work addresses that, but I, I think is more, more impactful to me. I, I'd like to actually ask a question about um, this moment that you're describing um, when, the, when the wall comes down and, and you start, that it's, it's around your first exposure to comics and you, you made this connection between, the, you're saying there's not a lot of money around and comics were something that you could make and were reproducible. Were, was that maybe something that a lot of people were making a connection to? Um, did, did comics present itself to others as a form that might work in this moment in time um, as, as a means of expression tied to it being affordable to produce? Um, or is that, is that something that you found um, with others that they, they also had that experience of the medium at that time or, or in any time really? I, I think it's an under-discussed aspect of it's, it's in general such a commercial medium, but it's maybe the medium that's most open to all, you know, because of the because of the price of the materials being as as low as possible. Um, 
until now, uh, the comics, uh, it, nobody can, in, in Germany, nobody can live from comics. This is not a job. This is not a profession. This is like a hobby. This is like a... So I, uh, in that time, it was completely not known in the east part of Germany to draw comics was really strange. And it was like a challenge. And my friends and me, we some of my friends, we had an artist group. There was Henning Wagenbrett and Detlef Beck and Holger Fickelschirer and me. We were four and uh, we, we tried to develop uh, very fast. Uh, we tried to um, learn to understand what is comic and to draw and to use it in our graphic uh, design. And um, we, we were like, we, we call ourselves a Solidar group. Is this right? A trans translatable in English? A solidar, we, we were Solidar. Uh, solidarity. In, in solidarity, solidarity with the, with each other to helping us to understand what is comic, what are posters, and so on. And this was very nice. And um, but at that time, when I was for the first time, for instance, I don't remember what it was. Was like ninety one. I was the first time on a German comic festival, and I was one of the less women they were not women not at all and um and in 91 uh, so uh it was also not a job and still today i feel uh, strange with my students that i teach something which seems to be not uh, really um profession like uh, to lead them in the <laughs> in the swamp or somewhere. I don't know. I feel a little bit uh, wrong, but in the same time, the situation in Germany is getting better. It's really getting better. I, I don't want to say something bad, but in other countries, I think it was much more easier. In Italy or in France, with comics, they were really a tradition. In Germany, not. I, I that brings up something where. You know, I th would you, it might be uh, to, to me, the lack of um, an ability to maybe make a living from this medium, I'd like to say, well, that allows it to be art. It's not connected to, I, especially it, comics in the conditions you're describing can't really be connected to building a career, much, let alone um, supporting yourself, it may, maybe in terms of cultural capital, it would be very hard. So to me, in an idealistic view, that means you can really make art because there's no, the stakes are low uh, in terms of anything not connected to the creation itself. But then of course, as you're describing the reality of it, making, you know, making art is helpful if you can make a living from, from the work you're making, you have more time to devote to it. Um, but do you feel that as things change, if you're saying that there's more of an ability to make a living from comics, do you feel maybe with your contemporaries that maybe came up through the same circumstances that you came up through, do you feel a difference in, in terms of the process of making comics and how they're received in terms of, in terms of them being art? Um, or, or just the, the contrast of that change in, in terms of how you feel about the medium? Um, I am sorry, I don't know if I understand the question sorry. right. <laughs> No, I'm just saying, I'm saying with that initial feeling of, of you can't make a living from it, um, but maybe there's a potential for it to be, to, to be just about making art. And now you're saying the conditions are, are changing and, and, and more. So, no, no I, I still can't make a living of it, not at all. And um, I also, a lot of my students or ex-students, and, and I think this is, I know that it's, I, I shouldn't say that to my students, but I, um, it's a, a big freedom uh, to work on your own projects and to develop them without any uh, control. And especially because I'm coming from a country where there was always a big control about everything what was written or done. Uh, I, I'm a very um, sensitive about control and things like that. That's why I, I, I feel that it's a big um, freedom and uh, makes me also interested. Uh, I, I hold this freedom in the way that I teach. Teach is with teaching I'm living and the drawing and all what I do is what I do without any 
subject. This with the museum was one of the um, less, I never have this uh, missions from, with the museum, but um, usually I do it by myself with own, I'm my own cli client. Hmm? Um, I, on that, that idea of, you know, um, of, of freedom in art is I, one thing that I, I think is maybe a contrast between cartooning in Europe and cartooning in the United States is a difference in the idea of, of self-publishing or, or people. I, I, I do think that there's, um, they just in, just in my, in, in my view, there, there does seem to be less people self-publishing, um, as as much as they self publish here, is that true in your experience? Um, you mean in Europe? You mean in Europe? Yeah, or, or yeah, or in in Germany or Italy. The idea of of. No, and of I know, uh, I know. Also, me and uh, a lot, a lot, a lot of people are self publishing. I don't know. No, I, I maybe I don't know enough the scene in uh, in the USA. Even if I. Um, bought uh, if if I could uh, always scenes and uh, little booklets uh, I like it a lot uh, but I think uh, my students everybody is publishing him or herself it's really uh, um, incredible what the students are doing even the student from who I came this evening also he for his exam he did uh, publishing himself his book and I hope that people will see it well, that's I'm I'm glad to be I I'm glad to be wrong about that. I'm glad I'm glad that there is um, uh, more self publishing than I I see things, but I always wonder. Um, yeah, I always I always wonder how much more there is that I'm not seeing. Can I ask you one more question of who maybe you um, and and please as I'm speaking, if someone else has another question, if if Anke wants to keep going, but th this will be uh, the question that that I might think of um, ending with, unless unless anyone else has a question. Who do you who do you think of as your contemporaries? Not just in cartooning, but just in in general. I mean, I'm, I'd be most interested in hearing other cartoonists that, that you think of as contemporaries. But I'm I'm interested in in who you think of in in that light as as peers uh, in the kind of art you make from your generation. Um... Well, there are a lot. <laughs> there are a lot, um, and um, from the beginning, maybe this is interesting. I don't know uh, if you know that, but I think um, the the nineties, the early nineties, were were somehow a changement of the comic scene in Europe. I found it like that because. Uh, I had the possibility to go in the Western countries and there I met suddenly a lot of um, very interesting drawers who were my age and uh, who developed a very special style. For instance, uh, the group of... Um, um, oh God, I'm, <laughs> I'm a little bit... The Belgium group. Uh, Frimok, for instance, uh, I like the artist, especially Dominique Goublé, or uh, I liked also the French group uh, L'Association at that time with David B, who I uh, very admire. Um, I liked also Italians like uh, Matotti and um, GP. And um, with some of them, I became also friend. It was like, um, like a, a, a meeting in a European level because uh, we were all in the same age and in Germany there weren't so much. So it was important to meet also Max in Spain who was all the people I, I said became also somehow groups or um, publishers themselves. And uh, I think this was very Im important for for us to feel um, connected. And uh, the most beautiful place for all these meetings has been in Lucerne in Switzerland. There was a beautiful festival, very artistic and not so commercial. And uh, Fumetto was the name. And that was, I think it was for our generation, a very important place. 
And um, still now I feel very connected to this um, artist I said, also René French and um, Stefano Ricci. And, uh, but meanwhile, I'm also connected with my work in the university. I'm convec uh, my dogs are sleeping. I don't know if you listen that, they are snoring very loud. Um, I am connected to very young artists and uh, I, I, we are still friends with ex-students. So I think it's, um, it's not only my generation. There are also very nice contacts, for instance, with Sascha Hommer, Birgit Weyer, German um, drawers. I'll just ask one follow-up question. Just with, with Matodi, when, when I, I, as reading it in the context that I have, reading Fires by Matodi, when that came out in Europe, was that kind of, was it considered revolutionary what he was doing with that book or was it considered like oh this this makes sense uh, this of course this had to happen or was that how I'm just curious personally how impactful that book was especially with other artists what uh, do you do you mean what Ma Matotti did yeah with or with that book fires specifically yes, I'm, just, yes. I'm just curious maybe like what the the scene of people you're describing or or your contemporaries what what people thought when that came out I think I, I think he's he's, uh, he's a great artist. Is one one of the greatest artists at all. I think he's um, he's he's doing so much different things. And I think yes, for me it was revolutionary. I don't know about others, but it was uh, how the pages worked in uh, one page and the other page with the colors and everything. Yes, for me it was um, also other. Uh, black and white drawing. Uh, now I'm, I'm missing the word uh, of one of my favorite books of him. Mm. Chimera, maybe. Hmm? Chimera. There's a, a black and white one he did, Chimera, which. which yeah. Yeah. No, I don't know uh, now. Uh, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> it's a little bit uh, with the languages, I'm a little bit confused. Yes, but I think for me, it was that and he's still like uh, um, a star to look at for me. <laughs> uh, what was, um, oh yeah, and he did uh, Raven with Lou Reed. Well, thank you, um, unless, yeah, yeah, or Stigmata. Um, unless <laughs> anyone, Stigmata. No, 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 it's not Stigmata, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, well, unless anyone else has another question, I, I really, um, really would like to thank uh, Anke for her time. I'm going to post a link um, to our YouTube channel. This talk has been recorded, and we will have um, we will have it up in its entirety uh, on this channel later today. On you can find so many other talks, um, close to uh, dozens and dozens uh, from from uh, the New York Comics Symposium. And um, we will continue to update them throughout um, throughout the season. But let me thank you again, Anke, for this for this talk um, and for um, for showing this for showing this work that that hasn't been seen uh, uh, by people and and for 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 answering these questions and and letting us letting us ask you questions. Yeah, thank you so much for this invitation and your attention and um, listening. Thank you. It was very interesting. And thank you to, to everyone who asked questions and, and the audience. And we will, um, next Tuesday, um, we will have a, um, the symposium will go back to its regular time at seven o'clock and we will have uh, Bill Cardalopoulos doing a um, part two of a, a survey of uh, avant-garde comics. So thank you so much. And I will, um, I will end the meeting. Thank you, Anke. Thanks, Anke. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Austin. Thanks, you guys.